Well, here we are back again, and we're we have one final episode that we want to do. I just cannot get Mel to take a vacation. He just wants to pour out all this new material, and he's coming up with so much. It's overwhelming all of us. I'm sure we're all agreed on that point. This time, what Mel wants to do is he wants to look at and see how did Islam, how did it become what it is? What was it before? Or where was it before? Or who was it before? So, Mel, there you are, smiling as ever, and you, yeah. in the middle of your vacation, you now are going to tell us who were these these Ishmaelites, these Hagarines, as they're well known, and why then did they then move into what we now know today is Islam? Help us here. Give us some yeah. background. Yeah, so I suppose a, a kind of a useful word to use maybe for the, the group called the Saracens in the 7th century might be proto-Islam as opposed to Islam, because really it's Abdul Malik that really brings Islam out of nowhere. But there was something there beforehand and essentially it was a religion without the cult of muhammad um, and there were a few other little things that were different about it as well but essentially this was um, an ancient sect it may have been a collection of different sects competing with each other you know the details are not entirely clear and uh, you know historical evidence is a bit thin on the ground so i'm, I'm keeping it low resolution on this one but, you know, enough to actually indicate that there was something there, even centuries before. And if you ask a lot of Muslims, Muslims have this really strong conviction that they're following the original religion of Abraham. They have this feeling that Muslims were there, even the time of Jesus and before. They were all Muslims all the way back. And obviously, that's an anachronism. But there's something there. There's an, a little element of truth to that, at least according to some of the sources that I'm going to reveal to you today so that's the the overall gist of what i'm going to talk to you about so i'm going to bring up the powerpoint now so the title for today is the religion of abraham that gave birth to islam in surah 2 135 it says they say be jews or christians so you'll be guided say rather we follow the religion of abraham inclining towards truths and he was not of the polytheists now i want to kind of um interpret that for you a little bit you you remember i spoke about the idea that umar and others were basically preachers and they were teaching others to be preachers well here's an example of it he's given an instruction to another preacher and he's he's basically saying well what do you say if they say you know, either be Jews or Christians. What what do you say back? And his response is, tell them this. The religion of Abraham. Uh, sorry, we follow the religion of Abraham. So that's essentially his response to the accusation. Okay, so that's the context. But what religion of Abraham is he talking about? So I'm suggesting today that Islam didn't just emerge out of nothing in a barren land from a pagan past. This is part of the sins argument, and we've all been fooled by it. Um, it is part of the sins argument that Islam could only have come about as a result of a special revelation to an illiterate prophet called Muhammad. That's what we've been told for centuries. There are clues from pre-Islamic times that this is just a convenient myth. So I'm here to debunk that myth today. Umar was just part of this ancient tradition. He didn't come up with it. He was a mouthpiece in the middle of the 7th century, but he was not the source of it originally. So was there something before Islam? There is a history of Arabs following the Jewish religion prior to Islam. This was akin to the God-fearers in Rome. These were, I don't know if you're familiar with the term God-fearers, but these are people that basically imitated the Jews without fully becoming Jewish themselves. So what was the focus of this religion? They were focused on Abraham, but also on other figures in the Jewish faith. The Arabs were imitators of the Jews, following many aspects of their religion, but while still maintaining a separate identity as Ishmaelites, they were, in other words, proselytes. Possibly distinct from and in addition to that, there were some Arabs, the Idumeans, that had been forcibly converted to Judaism by John Hyrcanus, or sorry, John Hyrcanus, in the second century BC, and uh, Joe in Red, Judu Red Judaism will probably talk about that at a future stage. He has a lot to say on that side of things, but today I'm just going to focus on this 
broad group of, of Arabs who basically like to follow the commandments that is found in the Old Testament without fully buying into all of the Jewish religion. They did, they did it in their own particular way. So why did Arabs follow Abraham? Well, Abraham is believed to have come from Ur in Mesopotamia to Haran and then entered the land of Canaan. And Arabs believe they are descended from him through Ishmael, who was the son of Abraham's concubine, Hagar. So that's the the reason they they um, they focus on Abraham. And they believe that this, well, they believe that the, the religion that they were following was the original religion, the one that was there before Judaism changed it all. And a quick note about Ur. Um, I've already mentioned that there's dispute about Ur, but this is some additional information that would argue that Ur was not where we th thought it was in southern Iraq. Sumerian Ur is never called Ur of the Chaldeans in hundreds of references in cuneiform texts. The Chaldeans were related to the Arameans and didn't penetrate the area of southern Mesopotamia until 900 BC. Genesis 24, 4 and 7 seems to put Abraham's birthplace in Upper Mesopotamia, where Laban lived. And interestingly, an Elba tablet refers to Ur in Haran. So there is a good case to be made for an Ur that's further north in Upper Mesopotamia. So it's significant that we, you know, we, that Ur may have come from there, but I think the key point really to draw from this is that the Ishmaelites believed that that's where their father of their father in faith had come from. Let me just interrupt you real quickly, uh, Mel. Uh, yeah. You're not suggesting that the what Sir Leonard Woolley has uncovered, the ziggurats of Ur and all the other trinkets and uh, that you see in the British Museum that he discovered in the 1920s and 1930s, that that's fraudulent. Then you're not suggesting that. No, I I think it's. I think there is counter evidence. He's identified one particular place and suggested this is the Ur of the Chaldeans, but there's some counter evidence that perhaps it's this is the wrong city. That there is a, a, a new Ur, another because Ur just simply means city. The city of the Chaldeans may have been further north, and that's all. That's all I'm saying. I'm not suggesting fraud or anything like that. Certainly, in the period of the seventh century A.D they would have thought that Ur was at a different place. We've already talked about this in another episode. Yeah. Now, there's, there seems to be, if you look at it, there seems to be two separate traditions. If you go to Turkey in, in Shalurfa today, you'll find plenty of tour guides that will swear that this is where Abraham was born. And if you look at the Islamic tradition, you'll actually see a story that Abraham um, went to Mecca riding on a flying horse coming from Armenia, of all places, which is way up there in northern Mesopotamia or north north of uh, Iraq, that location. So, I think centuries ago they just didn't know, and they had, you know, different traditions claiming that's where he came from. Okay. Now, um, Sasso Minas, a church historian from the fifth century, um, gives us some information about the Arabs in the past which is very helpful. He's writing about the history of the church in the years, about the church during the years of 323 to 425. And he mentions in chapter four that the Arabians, even way back then, had a devotion to the Oak of Mamre, the place to where the angels appeared to Abraham. So you can see that there was some cult around Abraham among the Arabs even back then. He seems to imply that the Ar uh, sorry the Arabians were doing it for pagan reasons. So let's have a look before we do so. So the arrows point into Hebron, and near Hebron is this oak of Mamre, which I think is still in existence today, as far as I know. Okay, now this is quite a long bit, but let's just go to the this bit here, and you can read the rest of it yourselves. Indeed, this feast is diligently frequented by all nations, by the Jews, because they boast of their descent from the patriarch Abraham, by the pagans, because angels there appear to men, and by Christians, because he who for the salvation of mankind was born of a virgin, afterwards manifest himself there to a godly man. I think 
this last bit I should explain this is a theophany um, now in the context for people who don't know what that means it's the appearance of God in human form yeah so now perhaps uh, Sosa Minas has a negative view of the Arabs here but he he labels them here in the context as pagans now whether he, he's been fair to them or not um, is disputable uh, but elsewhere he seems to to lean more towards the idea that they were in some ways imitators of the Jews. Okay, so against that idea that they that he thought they were pagans, he also gives us another idea that kind of leans more towards the idea that they were imitators of the Jews. So this is in chapter 38. He says, This is the tribe which took its origin and had its name from Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and the ancients called them Ishmaelites after their progenitor. As their mother, Hagar, was a slave, they afterwards, to conceal the opprobrium of their origin, assumed the name of Saracens as if they were descended from Sarah, the wife of Abraham. That's interesting there. He's suggesting that they call themselves Saracens to try and pretend that they are descendants from Sarah instead of descendants from Hagar, which is, whether true or not, it's interesting that this is what was being said in the 5th century. Such being their origin, they practiced circumcision like the Jews, refrained from the use of pork, and observed many other Jewish rites and customs. This sounds exactly like Islam, doesn't it? Mm. If indeed they deviate in any respect from the observances of that nation, it must be ascribed to the lapse of time and to their intercourse with the neighboring nations. So he's suggesting that they were trying to copy the Jews, but occasionally they kind of moved away from the customs because of interacting with presumably other uh, pagan nations okay now he he goes on to explain further how that ancient religion then developed he says moses who lived many centuries after abraham only legislated for those whom he led out of egypt the inhabitants of the neighboring countries being strongly addicted to superstition probably soon corrupted the laws imposed upon them by their forefather ishmael the ancient hebrews had their community life under this law only, using therefore unwritten customs before the Mosaic legislation. These people certainly served the same gods as the neighbouring nations, honouring and naming them similarly, so that by this likeness with their forefathers in religion, there is evidence their departure from the laws of their forefathers. As is usual in the lapse of time, their ancient customs fell into oblivion, and other practices gradually got the priestess among them. Some of their tribe afterwards, happening to come in contact with the Jews, gathered from them the facts of their true religion, returned to their king's men and inclined to the Hebrew customs and laws. From that time on until now, many of them regulate their lives according to the Jewish precepts. So if you're not following that, what he was saying is that in the past they were following the Jews and then they became more pagan for a while and they basically forgot their link with the Jews and then they discovered the Jews again as it were and they start finding out about Moses now because you can just imagine with the passage of time so we're talking a really ancient uh, religion here so they started imitating Judaism again but this time now they're taking on in addition the laws of of Moses now obviously this is written in the fifth century we don't know if if uh, Zazomenus uh, is correct in terms of the, the more ancient past, but certainly um, he's observing that these Arabs are imitating the Jews in the 5th century, and I think really, that's a really strong case for suggesting that this sect continued on until the 7th century, and then um, it transformed into what we call Islam today. Now, Sazimenus, uh, or Sazimen, I should say, also says that uh, more recently they have come to adopt Christianity, having come into contact with monks or priests. Some fully converted to Christianity, others may have simply imbibed merely an Aryan form of Christianity, which prevalent in the fourth century. Which, sorry, which was prevalent in the fourth century. We know through the work of Epiphanius that indeed the bishops of Petra and Arabia were both Aryans and this is my um, summary of what he was saying so 
you see how significant that is that he suggests that some of them became Christians, but some of them um, imbibed an Aryan form of Christianity. Um, and we can see that in the Islam we see today, which is the idea that uh, Jesus is not divine. He's just a, a, an ordinary uh, human being. I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Now, this is interesting because this then makes sense of why we have so uh, so, so much of the material that's on, let's say, even in something as simple as the Dome of the Rock, which is definitely Aryan, confronting the monophysite, confronting the, the also Chalcedonian view that would be the Byzantine view of Christ, which are both Trinitarian, and it's confronting this Trinitarian view, and it's also confronting the divinity of Jesus. This would make sense then if this is where the Arianists come from. In fact, you're answering a question that many have asked. Where did this Arian form come from? Well, the Arian form was already there. There were Arianists who were there from the fourth century on in that part of the world. And if that is the case, then it looks like Abdul, starting with Abdul Malik, we can't say if we want to, don't want to say it's starting with him, but he is the one that comes out really strong against uh, against the Trinity and the and the person and the divinity of Jesus. It looks like that Aryan form then really comes to the fore in uh, certainly in the structures and in the inscriptions and in the coins and whatnot uh, in the late seventh century. Yeah, and I think what's what's really helpful about this, you know, we we keep coming across the idea they've borrowed these ancient stories from centuries ago. How is that possible? And well, now we can see it's possible. If there is a tradition going way back centuries ago, uh, we can see that these stories got, uh, if you like, imbibed into their sect, and then they're being retold and retold, and they're being even used in their preaching, even though they've got nothing to do with the Bible, you know, these strange stories. You know, they're kind of semi-pagan, a lot of these stories, but obviously the Arabs had a kind of... a uh, an interest in, in in those stories and this is i would suggest the reason why we have these scraps and collections of all of these stories yeah, yeah, like the seven sleepers and so on something else mel yeah um, yeah if you are if you are an ishmaelite or a hegarin and you now are coming into dominance there in the seventh century and yet the greatest power of the day that's just north of you is christian and remember, we've said this before, those Christians have a prophetic line, those Christians have a scripture, the Jews who are right there on the Temple Mount, they also have a scripture, they have a prophetic line, where are you going to get your scripture and where are you going to get a prophetic line, where are you going to get that kind of identity that can compete with them, and yet you are now the political power, you are now raising yourself, and that's why Abdul Malik, by the time he comes to power in 685, he now controls that whole swath of land, but he doesn't have what his Christian and Jewish cousins have. He doesn't have what they have. So how would you make yourself distinct from them? Well, you probably go back to your Jewish antecedents of monotheism, and you consider those who are all around you have gone become polytheists by elevating, as you say, elevating Jesus to the status of divinity. Say not three, for God is one. That's on the Dome of the Rock. Chapter 4, verse 171 is on the Dome of the Rock. So it stands to reason that this Aryan, this Aryan uh, form of, which then takes precedence and then becomes the dominant theme for all of Islam later on, starts to be introduced at this period because now you want to create that Hagarin, that Ishmaelite identity, but you've got to create it that is different from those who are in power. What's the best way to do that? Make sure that you confront that polytheism. They have become polytheists. In contradistinction yeah. to the early Jews who were monotheists. Yeah. And I would say as well, the thing that they need, they need um, a scripture that they can all gather around. So you need a Quran and you also need a common language to bring this nation together. Um, and so that's that's really what Abdul Malik and, and the caliphs that followed him really Look at the set coins. about the doing. The coins back you up on that. They take away the Greek script and they replay, he replaces it with the Arabic script. He is the first to do the Arabic script there. He they, they take away and they mock Justinian and his two sons on the 692 coin. He goes, Justinian II goes to war with him. So he then introduces his own image and then puts that script there. That's the Arabic script. And then finally by 696, he takes away all images and only has this Arabic script, which then continues on until today. So that's all introduced in the late 7th century 
this is another example of what you're saying. This is this identity, create an identity, and it's going to be around a language. It's going to be around a person, and it's going to be, well, we don't know about the person yet, but it's certainly going to be uh, in contradistinction to that which they are competing against, their cousins, who are also trace the lineage back to Abraham. But those cousins, the Jews and the Christians, trace it through Isaac, whereas they trace their lineage back through, in this case, Ishmael. Yeah. Um, and I think something to kind of suggest as well is, you know, if, you, if you've if you been living under the shadow of the Christians and Jews for centuries, mm. trying to be like them, you, you would have a certain inferiority complex. And so what you do then, you, you want to impose something new. You want to create something different and make yourself distinctive from them instead of just copy. But unfortunately, they didn't ma manage to stop copying, but they tried. Well, have we not been saying this for years? Islam really is an attempt to create an identity that is in contradistinction to those who have the bigger identity, the greater identity. And everything we've known now about this Jerusalem thesis starts from the premise that it all began in Jerusalem. It all began from the biblical text. It all began much further north. How then are you going to create your own identity? You can't. First, they did stick it in Jerusalem to begin with. You can see that's going to cause problems later on down the line. Back to you. Yeah. You can see, uh, just to, f to follow your point there, you can see if they've been following the Jewish and Christian scriptures for centuries, you can see why then Jerusalem is so important to them, why they must have that Temple Mount and have it for themselves, even if it means driving the Jews from the Temple Mount. And, and they have been keeping the Jews even to this day. You know, if Jews want to go to visit the Holy of Holies, they're not allowed to go in there. So it's, it's, it's part of that. So let me just... Next slide. So there is a continued interest in Abraham um, in the 6th century and evidence for that um, can be found in terms of rock inscriptions, a thing that I like. The name Abraham has been found 74 times on 6th century inscriptions at Nisana near Gaza. Um, the name was being used for people's names. Obviously, the you know one way of showing that you revere someone is to call your children that name and we can see that in the 6th century. Um, and then there's evidence from the Mishnah. We get a strong hint of Arabs taking on Jewish practices in this short piece from the Mishnah. Uh, it says, all bloodstains that come from Rechem are clean. Rechem is another uh, name for Petra. So here comes Petra. Rabbi Judah declares them unclean because the people who live there are proselytes, though misguided, which I presume he's referring to the Arabs. Those that come from non-Jews are clean. Those that come from Israelites or from Samaritans, Rabbi Mir declares them unclean, but the sages declare them clean because they are not suspected in regard, in regard to their stains. So that's interesting that there's a reference to the Arabs as proselytes in Petra, of all places. So, as I say, it's it's not clear if this is... Oh, uh, I should just emphasize Reckham is one possibility. Uh, sorry, Petra is one possibility for Reckham. I think that's probably the most known place that's called also Reckham. Um, it's not clear if this Reckham is the Reckham that has been identified as Petra by Ep Epiphanius, but there is at least a good likelihood that those proselytes were Arabs. Now, we've seen this on a number of occasions now uh, when when we've been looking at the Jerusalem thesis. In the 660s, we get a number of indications that this Abrahamist sect was chief among the Believers Movement, otherwise known as Mu'minin, which was a collection of Jews, Christians, and this Arab sect. Sabius says the following, Having located the spot called the Holy of Holies, they constructed their place of prayer for themselves with the foundations and superstructure. But the Ishmaelites envious of them expel them so the people who were doing this building this the uh this prayer place with with the jews presumably but the ishmaelites envious of them expelled them from that spot and called the same building their own place of prayer they the jews erected elsewhere another place for their worship so you can see the jews wanted to use this place again as their place of prayer but the ishmaelites who were envious of them um, expelled them and basically said we'll have that and we'll make this our important place of prayer 
Now, we also have the chronicler of Khuzestan in the 660s. He says, regarding the dome of Abraham, we have been unable to discover what it is except that because the blessed Abraham grew rich in property and wanted to get away from the envy of the Canaanites, he chose to live in the distant and spacious parts of the desert. Since he lived in tents, he built that place for the worship of God and for the offering of sacrifices. I believe what he's referring to there is the idea of the tabernacle, the tents out in the desert. It took its present name from what it had been since the memory of the place was preserved with the generations of their race. Indeed, it was no new thing for the Arabs to worship there, but goes back to antiquity to their early days in that they show honour to the father of the head of their people. In other words, Abraham. Okay, um, so Sabius refers to a person called Muhammad um, when he writes in the 660s. Now, I think the, the, the key thing before we look at what he says about this person called Muhammad, the title Muhammad, this is not the Muhammad of the standard Islamic narrative because we're talking about someone in, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Muhammad of the tradition was never in Israel apart from the mythical story of him on a flying horse. Um, he was meant to have died in 632. The only person who um, was in Israel um, in the 630s was Umar. And so, and there's, for example, if we look at Thomas the Presbyter, he, he talks about this person called the Muhammad of the Tayyayi um, in February of 634. And then there's an anonymous reference to a prophet armed with a sword who is um, set in July 634. Both of those references um, correspond with Umar. And I think when Sebius here is talking about Muhammad um, about 30 years later, I think it's fair to say he's talking about Umar and not um, the, the fictional Muhammad that we know. And I think one of the things we could also say about um, the name Muhammad for those who are not aware, is Muhammad is actually a word which means temple. And what a great title for Umar to, to, to put upon himself because he was obsessed with the Temple Mount. It's pretty clear from the 7th century sources. First thing he did after invading Jerusalem was to go about building a masjid, a house of prayer uh, for his sect. And... Uh, and we can see that he belonged to the sect that we've, we've been referred to in this quote from Sebius. What's interesting here, this is probably a, a really early reliable quotation from the person in history who took on the title Muhammad. But the focus is on Abraham. It's not on Muhammad here. It's a totally different take on things. Um, so I'll just read it very quickly. With an oath, God promised that land to Abraham and his posterity with him forever. Now you are the sons of Abraham, and God will realize in you the promise made to Abraham and his posterity when he loved the God of Abraham, and go and take possession of your country, which God gave to your father Abraham, and none will be able to resist you in battle, for God is with you. He's basically making a religious argument for why they're entitled to, to that particular land. They're entitled to the Temple Mount. They're entitled to Canaan, and this is, you know, the argument that's been going on since then between the Palestinians and the Israelites. Don't want to bring up politics, but essentially you can see the traces of it here. He's saying, well, we're also a descendant of Abraham. And if God has promised this land to Abraham, then we're entitled to it. And so he uses it as a clever argument to justify why they're entitled to um, conquer these lands armed with a sword. No. So, as I said, the historical person who built the original masjid on the Temple Mount, as we've said before, was Umar in 634-644. The Doctrine of Jacobi refers to an unnamed prophet armed with a sword in 634, and Thomas the Prester refers to the Tayyaye of Muhammad east of Gaza in 634. So this all ties together nicely. This is Umar, not the Muhammad of the Sen. So was Umar the person called Muhammad? I would suggest this is who it was. Now, if we turn to the important stations of Abraham in Israel, um, the phrase station of Abraham is found in the Quran. This is a place where Abraham had been in his lifetime. 
So we look at the first one here, Shechem. Upon coming to Canaan, Abraham first settled in Shechem. Uh, we saw that there's a Qibla underneath the Dome of the Rock pointing north from Jerusalem. So they're acknowledging that importance even under the Dome of the Rock. Uh, Mount Moriah, this is where Abraham attempted to offer Isaac in sacrifice. We can now see and understand why uh, this group of Saracens, when they invaded Jerusalem, what did they want to do? They wanted to build a house of prayer where Abraham had uh, offered Isaac in sacrifice. So it makes logical sense now that we kind of considered the centuries before that time. And then we have uh, the Oak of Mamre. It's where Abraham met the three angels. So this is another station. And then finally we have Beersheba. This is where Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert. So as you can see, it's all way up there in the north. Um, and I think really when you, when you gather all of that together, we can now start to see how Islam didn't just come out of thin air. We can see the history. We can see what happened logically in the 7th century with Umar invading Jerusalem, building the masjid. Towards the end of the 7th century, we see Abdul Malik really pushing a new cult now, the cult of Muhammad, instead of the cult of Abraham. And then from the 8th century onwards, you know, this story gradually changed and changed um, and uh, a, a fictional biography emerged. So my conclusion is, is Islam emerged out of a pre-existing sect or sects that followed Judaism in their own distinctive way. The cult around the Muhammad figure was just an appendage that was added on in the latter half of the 7th century, possibly, possibly in response to Umar's untimely demise, which is uh, he got assassinated in uh, 644. So that's it. I'll come back to you, Jay. Mm. Thanks once again. Again, you're just, in some ways, this is a good conclusion for all the series that we have done looking at the antecedents to the Jerusalem thesis. You've gone through and you've mentioned the proto Islamic. Uh, proto Islam is really the people you're talking about. These, these, these Abrahamists, you've used that word before. Uh, they're not really Jews, they're not Christians, but they're what we would call and what historians have always called as Ishmaelites because they they call themselves that there's lots of references to them calling themselves Ishmaelites they call themselves Hagarines they call themselves Saracens they call themselves Mahajarun and if they call themselves Makre and if you look at those five names they all are saying the same thing an Ishmaelite in the line of Ishmael a Hagarin in the line of Hagar who is the mother of Ishmael uh, their, their whole Saras Sarasin would be they this is their re reference they want to be seen as part of sarah though they're not really they're, it's a, it's in some ways it's a contradiction to ishmael and hagar they yeah. hold uh, the whole thing with magre magre with people of the god people of uh, we used to always say it's a uh, the magreb but it isn't actually it's not what it is we now know that it's the people of hagar hagar people of hagar which is again hagarin and then of course mahadurun are people who are always on the movement they are nomadic and exactly that, like abraham just like Abraham, they were nomadic. Now, so if that is the case, it, it stands to reason what you're doing here is that these people had an identity that was, it, they didn't really have an identity. This is a problem with identity. You need to have identity built on some historical figure or some historical context or place or a historical book. People to place in the book. And in fascinating, you can see these people who are now taking over and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Now they become uh, the Umayyad Caliphate with with Mu'uya, how are they going to create this identity? Where are they going to go through? And you look back and you said, if you look back, you will see that sometimes they were, they mimicked the Jews. Sometimes they came alongside the Jews. Sometimes they were pagan, but they seem to have gone from pro-Jew to pagan, then come back to pro-Jew again. So they're imitators of Jews. Uh, fascinating, even to the point of even wanting to be in the line of Sarat. So that's why they call themselves Saracens. They circumcised themselves like the Jews did. They didn't eat pork like the Jews did. And then some became Christians, others then became Aryan against the Christians. And it's the Aryans that I would suggest are the ones that actually started dominating. You mentioned the bishops that were actually Aryan in the seventh century. Yeah. What's fascinating then is you talk about the Mu'minin. The Mu'minin are these believers. 
who are made up of both Jews, Christians, and pagans, but or the Arabs or the Ishmaelites. And it's the Ishmaelites who then they want really Moriah. Everybody wants Moriah. Everybody wants Jerusalem. Everybody wants the city and they want that one place. That's where Abraham, since they're Abrahamists, since they are all Ishmaelites, since they're Haganites, they want where Abraham went, where he went to sacrifice Isaac. So who comes along? Well, then you see this man named Umar comes along. He comes around in about 638. He finally gets Jerusalem. And the first thing he does is he builds slaps that building right there on the Temple Mount. This is where Abraham, uh, this is where everybody wants. This is Marwa. Marwa would be the derivative or uh, I, I, I want to say it's it's the Arabization of Moriah. Yeah. Sabaeus talks about Umar and all the fact that, that Umar was wanted to be everything Abrahamist. He was very much about that sort. Not from Mecca Medina, from over, well, over to the east. So we're talking about this side, over to the east. He's from what is today here or today Kufa. And then what you do is you go in and you continue with this idea. But you talk about the, the if you look at where Abraham, the, the, the four major cities that Abraham really talks or refers to. One is Shechem, where he first arrived when he came uh, from Mesopotamia. Moriah, where the sacrifice was to have been. Mamra, the Oak of Mamra. Uh, and where he met the angels, and then Beersheba, where he threw out Hagar. Those are the four cities. Those four cities are all through this material. They are all part of this tradition. And it is this guy, Ubar, that we're coming more and more to, that we're focusing more and more on because of the fact that he was the one that Sabaeus is talking about. He is the one that Thomas Presbyter is talking about. He is the one that the doctrine of Iacobi seems to be referring to. These are all 7th century documents. They all seem to be referring to this guy named Umar whose nickname or epithet could be Muhammad the Praise One, or as you say, the temple. That's a whole new other understanding of this name, Muhammad, the temple itself. And what does he do? He starts and slaps his, his structure up there. Comes Who comes and then rebuilds it again? Muawiyah rebuilds it in 661, 666, 61. Who then rebuilds it again? Abdul Malik. And by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, he then builds the biggest structure of its day, the finest building of its kind, the Byzantine architecture, slaps it in. It's still there today. We can still see it. Go to Jerusalem. You can see it right there on the Temple Mount above this rock, this famous rock, this rock underneath, which now has a, a hollow place underneath. All of this is pushing and showing that this is how Islam began. It followed a sequence. Why are we surprised that it didn't evolve? Why are we surprised that it came out of this identity crisis that they were having? These Abrahamists really have identity crisis. They can't, they want to be Jew, yet they don't want to be Jew. They want to be Christian, but they don't want the they don't want the what the seeming polytheism of Christianity. They don't want the Trinity. So what do they do? They try themselves, and they're politically already they're creating and they're gaining an awful lot of ground. But they then by the time of the money comes to power, remember the Umayyad dynasty had been in power for thirty years by this time. He's an Umayyad. What does he finally do? Well, then he slaps down his own Arabist, his own Hagarin. You might say it is a anti-Christian, mainly anti-Christian cult that is Aryan. Therefore, it's monotheistic, going back to the monotheism of Judaism. His perception is that the Christians have become pagan because of their polytheism, seeming polytheism. Go ahead. I was just going to say, did you notice in any of that presentation any reference to the need for a revelation from the angel Gabriel? There is not. Not a thing. It's all explained historically. There's no need for a divine intervention here. It's all explained. There's nothing there for a Muhammad to get. The, these these um, scraps, these bits of materials, they are not the lecturing themselves. They're, they are only referencing a, a lecturing that's been lost. The lecture is just a collection of biblical passages. Both of us could read that quite happily. It's just the Bible, essentially, in nice, easy passages, nice chunks. But what it, the Quran, what we call today the Quran, is simply the correspondence between the organizers, these, this movement of the believers. It's, it's basically a correspondence of the believers. That's essentially what you're seeing in the Quran. I'm not going to agree with that right now. now <laughs> okay, you, that's all right. We this. may differ I, on that I, one. <laughs> I would suggest that these are lectionary because have you you haven't read yeah. Luther Luling's book? He comes very. Oh, clearly. maybe I may he change my mind. So strophe yes. for strophe, exactly the same, even strophe for strophe. This beautiful poetry that Muslims always talk about in the Quran. Yeah. 
actually those can be found strophe per strophe from the Syriac writings. Okay, yeah. That's why Dan uh, Brubaker has, you don't know this, but Dan Brubaker is saying, we need to go back to this book. We need to get back and get and really start reading this. You've got to read this guy. I mean, it's very long and it's yeah. huge. And uh, uh, he yeah. has he was ahead of his time and he's no longer living. That's Luling. That's Gunther Luling. Luling. It's not, this is yeah. not uh, Luxembourg, this is Luling. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I would suggest these are not just discussion points. These are actually these are actually lectionaries. These are wow. many of them are Christian hymns written wow. in Aramaic. Okay. These are yeah. actual Christian hymns that he has been able to find that shows exactly. But what they have done is once you take it out of the Syriac and the Syriac Aramaic and put them into Arabic, you lose an awful lot of the meaning, but you also lose an awful lot of the beauty. And because of that, when you do one step further and start adding the diacritical marks in the eighth century, you leave, lose even more. So what yeah. has finally been, what we now finally have, despite the fact there are 93,000 differences in these, what we now have today is not it's just a facsimile isn't everything we're finding a facsimile it's a Absolutely. facsimile of what originally was there the beautiful christian hymns that were gorgeous when they were first written no longer are that beautiful yet the muslims go on and on about how beautiful is how could someone who's illiterate have written something so beautiful and i keep on reminding them be careful be careful this is not muhammad this is not a man this is not even those who put the quran together they have just borrowed this but that's for yeah. another time for when we get into the quran and, and there's an awful lot there that we have to unpack yet out of luling and also luxembourg's material uh that uh, that will show that most all of these mystery letters actually are explained much of the 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 20 percent of the quran that they don't understand can now be explained if you just go back to the christians that wrote it now because of this what you're showing is not only and, and to get off the quran now back to the man himself the umar and then of course abdul malik I love what you have done here. You have shown that there is a chronology. There is an evolution. There is, if you follow what's happening on the ground, as we've said many times, follow what's going on happening in the seventh century. Just follow it through and you will see how Islam finally began to come to, came to form. We, we, are, we, haven't really, we haven't really gone further than the eighth century. We haven't, we've just intimated what was happening in the ninth century and 10th century. We blamed an awful lot on the ninth and 10th century, but we do need to still come back and uh, put it all together at one time. We'll do that in the future. But this is fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Going back My again, pleasure. helping us with the Jerusalem thesis. Terrific stuff. What you are doing, what Paul's doing. God bless you and uh, Murad and Joe and all the rest. You guys have been a real joy. The gems you're coming up with, I love them. Let's see how the people react. Now, those who are watching, do react. Help us out. These are green papers. We want to make them into white papers so that we can get them out there as real proposals. But until then, let's hear your comments. Let's see where you're going to go with it. And let's see how is it we're going to piece all this puzzle together. God bless you. This is Jay here in the United States. Mel over there in Europe. 3,000 miles away. Over now. out.